We all have someone who has influenced us in our life, uh, especially to make either good choices or bad choices. I know for me, uh, I'll mention two, which are probably not, um, it's kind of weird, but I'll mention these. There's a lot of people who have had influence on me, but one, uh, to make a career um, decision. A lot of people are not decided. For some reason, I went to registration at the gym, at the university, and with my brother, older brother, and, and I asked him, like, what do you think I should do? I mean, I like math. I don't know if there's anything that has to do with math. I want to study dentist, dentistry, but I didn't even know what I was going to do. And all he said was, try engineering. What is that? So, so I went and signed up for engineering and introduction, and, and I, I went off. I liked it, but that's all he said. How about just try that one? That was the influence he had, and it actually, I made a, dis a decision based on that. And that's on the career side. On the spiritual side, my mom, uh, since I was like seven years old, she would, I would say, drag me to church against my will, right? And uh, have something, that's why I said it's kind of weird, but they had an influence on me. And uh, she would take me to church, and uh, I didn't like it. Uh, until I was in high school, I, I kind of said, you know what, I don't, I don't like that. I'm going to make my own decisions. So I started making my own decisions in my freshman year in college. And so I made, and eventually, those things that I was taught in Sunday school, which honestly, I hate to say this, don't do as I did, which is skip Sunday school. The, the store was ruined here. So, so they had... Uh, Sunday school first and then service, and I had already calculated exactly when I was kind of when it was going to start because in the Baptist church it is exactly to the minute, uh, and they had a bell to ring and everything. So I knew exactly, and I was what like nine, ten years old, and I would walk to the store uh, because I don't know, I was bored, I just it wasn't interesting. And then right around the time when I had to come in because the service was going to start, I came right in like if I had, you know. Uh, had been in, in class, but nobody ever told my mom or anything, I guess, and I got away with it for a long time. But still, it still had an influence on me. I still, um, at, at age 19, 20, I started on my own. So I became convinced by the grace of God. I don't know how, but God had a way. Uh, but still, some people have had influence on us. It's important that we get influenced to make the right decisions because there's a lot of bad influences out there. And especially for our kids, we really want them to, to hang around, like they say, with the right crowd. Um, I had a, a, a principal in ninth grade that I see him often. Later on, his son was my best friend. And then I see him still just like about two weeks ago. I said, you know, you were the one that spanked me. Nobody else spanked me. Well, yeah, there was another one. But I said, uh, <laughs> But, you know, they should still have that in the, in, in the school district. Yeah, I know. oops, I said, I'm sorry, I, I spanked you at home. I said, I actually needed it. That helped. To a certain degree, it helped. Um, but he spanked really hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, Gonzalez. And, and so now, and like, I, he liked the fact that I told him, I said, come over to our house, come over to but some people have had good influences, especially in the school district. The, the, the teachers have a lot of influence, right? But it's important that we have uh, good people having good influence because there's bad influence. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15 says, bad company corrupts good character, right? Bad company, who you hang around with, is going to make you who you are. And um, in... 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting verse 1, we read that passage. And if you look at the list, it's a long list of at, uh, description of people who we would not want to be like, right? We start pointing fingers and we don't want to be like that because it's an ugly list. And we don't want our children to be that way. Look, 
But realize this, then last days, difficult times will come. Verse 1, for men will be lovers of self. It's about me. Lovers of money. It's about the dollar bill. Boastful, arrogant, revilers. And look at this. Disobedient to parents. Uh, ungrateful, unholy. And I'm sure that you guys can be thinking of people when those, that list is coming up. You think probably you put a name there, right? And the sad thing is we have been there, right? And uh, if we do our own inventory of our own characteristics or somebody else does it for us, it's sad that we may fall into these. Uh, unloving, verse 3, ir irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than God. I mean, it's a long list. Holding a form of godliness, although they have denied his power. Avoid such men. Why? Because you're going to have an influence on us. And the sad thing is that uh, the church is being influenced uh, by the world. The world has a lot of power to influence all of us, and they have. Um, it goes on, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate women, weak women, weighed down with their sins, led by various impulses. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Very superficial living. No depth in knowledge. Superficial, superficial, and then taken away, is what he's saying. Verse 8, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. Um, there's going to be opposition. People who are going to reject what you believe. There's going to be opposition. And the question, are we ready? Especially the young people who are going to start college. There's a lot of thinking out there that's erroneous. And here at Living Word, we try to prepare young people to be ready for the world and their ideas and their recklessness. This is what we're coming up against. And if, if us as parents are not ready, your kids are going to be in that list. And that's a sad story. So what is needed? A deeper knowledge of God to be ready when difficult times come. We may have knowledge about God, but maybe not knowledge of him personally. Yeah, our parents taught us. People have told us about him. Um, but us personally. And then um, verse 9, I mean, you may say, well, yeah, I know. I know the Bible. But eventually it becomes evident that we make foolish decisions because we're not deep-rooted. Verse 9, he says, but they will not make further progress for their folly, that's foolishness, stupidity, will be obvious to all. It's going to be known. Just as Janus and Jamus, folly was also. I mean, it's not going to work. And, and, and there's going to be sadness. So we've got to be equipped. We've got to be ready. Um, verses um, 1 through 9, we see difficult times and worldly people. We must be ready. The message, Christians must develop deep knowledge of God if they will be influenced to others. Not the other way around. If we want to be an influence to the world, we must develop a deeper knowledge. Look at verse 10. We have, we, we're going to need good role models. Uh, and here at the church is what we try to do. Our vision here at the church is um, some small that we can remember it. Knowing God deeply and then loving people fully. As we know God ourselves within our hearts, then we genuinely, genuinely, not superficially, can really love people. That's the vision. And then the purpose in CE, Christian education, uh, which is what we're um, uh, appreciating today, the teachers, those who instruct, those who teach. Um, that's why I bring this message. The purpose statement of the Church of Living Word is to instruct and model experiential knowledge of what? Of the life-giving, biblical, therefore sacrosanct truths, both at the individual level and at the corporate level. 
So we have individually, we have one-on-one -on -one meetings, and then corporately at times we have group meetings, and then we have these big meetings for the purpose of communicating knowledge of our experience. First-hand knowledge, not just intellectual, not just theoretical, but something how it has actually impacted us. And we hear that every week, right, as the pastor brings sermons and how it applies to our lives. Uh, verse 10, we have a great, great role model. We wish our children had role models like this person. But then on the other hand, we say, oh, maybe not. Because look at this role model, the Apostle Paul. He says, now you followed my teaching, Timothy. He's telling Timothy because verse Timothy, the second Timothy is for Timothy. Uh, and it's not just my teaching, the information that I'm giving you, but also my conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance. Persecutions and sufferings. Um, this was the example that Timothy had. Um, we don't want our kids to suffer, right? Uh, let's save them from the pain. <laughs> so that's why I said, yes, we want a Paul, but we don't want the pain that comes with that learning. And the sad thing is, isn't that how our children actually learn? I told you about my principal that spanked me. I, I, I have a lot of examples that... Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Guido keeps saying, you're spanking, you're spanking me. <laughs> yes, in so many ways, God spanks us because when we have pain, then we can learn. Uh, but we don't want the pain. But we want to learn. But our learning is going to be superficial. That's going to be the problem. So we need to connect with people. If we want to grow deeply, we have to find teachers or people who could teach us where their teaching aligns with their conduct or their character, as we see here. Uh, the teaching aligned with their conduct or character. And we'll see that because these people make sacrifices. When they make sacrifices to give to you, wow, that's their life. And we see that every day when our teachers are giving that. Um, someone who's uh, teaching is aligned with their life. And then someone who knows God experientially, look at verse 11. Sufferings as such as happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra. And what happened in Lystra? They almost killed Paul and left him there as if he was dead. Uh, what persecutions I endure. And then he says, and out of them the Lord rescued me. He had firsthand knowledge of the work of God in his life. It wasn't something that, oh, you see that person over there? God helped him. You see that other person? Oh, look what God is doing in him. What is God doing in me? How have I experienced God helping me? That is experiential knowledge. And that's what we try to do. It's not that we have all this knowledge in the world, all this, you know, uh, perfect knowledge. As we learn, we try to apply it to everyday life. Uh, and then someone who will speak the truth to you, even though it might not be something you want to hear. Look at verse 12. He said, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And this is all, not just some. The problem is that here in America, we are not getting persecuted like in, in Paul's time. Or even in other countries. Uh, in other countries, you cannot identify as a Christian. Or you may die. Here, you're not going to die. But you will suffer discomfort. Oy. And discomfort is a big problem because we have to have everything. We don't have to have air conditioning. We have to have everything. And when things don't go right, we start saying the words we shouldn't say, doing the things we shouldn't be doing right. And that's how it shows up. We're not ready. But here Paul is speaking truth, even though it's something that in our time may not want to be heard. I just want to hear the positive things. I just want to hear the good things, that Jesus is going to bless me, bless me. He's saying, all who desire to live a godly life will suffer persecution. If you just live godly, people are going to hate you because you're showing them up. Um, and then the problem is that we get taken away easily when we don't have deep knowledge because there's a lot of people that look like Christians. Look at verse 13. It says, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Our children get deceived because look, and there's a lot of imposters. That's the word. A look alike. They look like the real thing. 
And so they get deceived. We get deceived. We get taken because, oh, this feels right. This looks right. Look, that person over there. Impostors, he says. Be careful. So we must have deep roots. Otherwise, we're going to be deceived. And then look at verse 14. You, however, Timothy, continuing the things you have learned and become convinced of. That right there, convinced of, meaning like me, I was brought up and dragged, perhaps against my will, right? Uh, I memorized verse, Bible verses, which is a good thing. We have to teach our kids uh, to learn and memorize. But then later in life, it, you know, God will use that. But here, Timothy now says, you have been convinced of. It's not something that somebody is uh, forcing you to do. You yourself, personally, this is your faith. This is your belief. This is not something that because your parents went to that church or that church. It's a decision that you make because you believe it. Not because of the pastor, not because of me, but because you believe. You've been convinced of, he says, <clears throat> and uh, because you knew it uh, from when you have, and you knew who you learned them from. Who did he learn them from? He learned them from his grandma and from his mom. Not by a Billy Graham, not by a great evangelist, but from home. Not from the dad. Imagine that. The dad is absent all the time, right? And we see that here too. But the mom and the grandma is the one that was in charge to bring him to the word. Probably took him to to, uh, to uh, the temple and, and to, I'll call it church back, back then. Um, but he knew the Bible, the Old Testament is what he knew. He was taught word by word. And we need to learn to communicate the word at home too. Um, when Sarah was three years old, her first Bible verse was, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's it. Well, we cut it off. But for her to memorize Start memorizing, and we recorded her, and she said, "Real cute." And then at you know age four and five, after five, I think we stopped. But then we, uh, I think Second Timothy three sixteen was another one. Uh, Ephesians, obey your parents. You know that was in there. That was important. And but it was so cute to hear a three year old saying the words of God. And the Bible does instruct us as parents to communicate the word. It has to start at home. Now, if you're not modeling uh, that God is priority, they're going to see that. And how does that show up? Well, I mean, church will come later. This is first. You know what? This is first, God's second. We may say God's first, but in our life, God is really second. That's what I mean. They, we need to model what we're saying. And that from childhood, he said, you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. I mean, why was Paul trying to re remind him of something he already knew? He's older now. Because possibly Timothy was already being discouraged. The world is vicious, and it can discourage us, it can deviate us. So very important that we come back and be reminded every week because even as adults, we can forget. And so to be reminded every week is very important. Uh, and then uh, finally, what's very important is that we must value the word of God. Value. And I say value because look at the first word. It says, all scripture, well, not the first, I'm going to look for it over here, is inspired by God and profitable. It's like a, like a business word, profitable. We can't do business if there's no profit, if there's no money, right? What kind of profit is there here? What's the gain? The gain, uh, we'll see in verse 17. There's a gain. But why is it so valuable? It says here it's inspired by God. That word is, it came out of the mouth of God. God breathed these words. Well, wait a minute. Didn't Paul write to Timothy? Didn't Paul write, I mean, Peter write to uh, the Jews and so forth and so on? They're, they're human writers. And this is where in the higher education, they start throwing curveballs to our young people. And if they're not ready, then they're going to devalue the word of God. So it's very important that they constantly, constantly our children, ourselves, be reminded that the word of the Bible that we have here is inspired by God. Uh, and 2 
first, I'm sorry, first Peter 1, 20 and 21 says that these men were influenced by God or moved by God to write. Yes, God just used their hands like puppets, in, so to speak, but it was God actually uh, communicating the content. So, and yes, it requires faith to believe that, but this is what the Bible tells us here. Now, why is it profitable? It's for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. And the gain is so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. To be trained, to be ready, to be able to do a good work, which is what? To help other people. Not just to take from people, but to help people. To be an influence to others, not to be influenced by the world. But um, we are to be able to allow the Bible to teach us, it says here. If the Bible, we do not allow the Bible to do that to us, um, then we may not get that gain. Um, because we read the Bible because we want to know more than people. We, we want to say, hey, man, look what I know. And it shows up. But in order for ha us to have this gain, we have to be ready to allow it to criticize us, reproof, it says there, to surface in us what's not good. It says here, verse uh, and the verse says, reproof. Nobody likes to be told that they're wrong. And that's what it says here. If you want to learn, if you want to grow deeply, you got to allow yourself to be corrected, it says here. To be told, hey man, this is not right. And the Holy Spirit will do that. And this Holy Spirit uses people too, which is our teachers and those people who are communicating the word. But oh, you're being too mean to our child. That's what's needed. Look, right there it says, reproof is what's needed. Correction. Uh, moms and dads, moms especially, allow our teachers to communicate truths that may, the child may not like. You know what I mean? And that's the commitment as parents that we need to be able to, to do, to commit, say, I'm um, it's not just the home that's going to help the children. It's the church to communicate God's holy word. Um, so I challenge you, commit to being faithful into Sunday school. I mean, if you're not committed, don't expect your kids to be committed. Number two, maybe you should be teaching a Sunday school. Well, I'm not ready. Well, none of us are. But commit to have an influence on other people. And then finally, are we passing on the word of God to our children at home? And it doesn't have to be like we have to have a Bible study and very formal, but there's teaching moments, like they say, um, <clears throat> but to be ready to communicate when there's either pain or when there's events, to communicate what does God have to say. But the fact is that a lot of times we don't know how to communicate because we don't know how to relate the Bible to what's going on. And so as parents, we have to learn that. Um, so I encourage you, as you see what the teachers are doing, maybe you would be encouraged to in a certain commit. Way. Um, not just because I say, because the Bible is very clear that um, it's, a, it's a hostile world and we need God's help. And that's what the church is for. So let my life be the proof, the proof of your you